Um, speaking of life affirming, <laughs> let's start this episode. This is, no, let me start this the proper way. It is Saturday, the 10th of August. I'm Chris, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. thinking we should probably record our pre-shows and put them online because the, the stuff we discussed before <laughs> the episode is sometimes really interesting okay we're back this is the future of photography of Chris. <laughs> for our patreon members that was a joke <laughs> that was a joke everybody <laughs> yeah <laughs> we, we had we had that discussion someone asked to support us and we had that discussion and um we'd love to do this but this show would have to be much much bigger to make this the, the whole the whole bookkeeping the whole three countries, accounting and so on you know, is, is yeah. it would swallow up so much that it's not worth it to be honest so if you want to support us support your favorite photo club or your favorite i don't know photographer like, <laughs> Could uh, you just email us money individually <laughs> email exactly. i accept cash i don't know about you guys um What's any cash? decent currency i mean we all live in a country with a decent currency right I so bitcoin <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah no let's not go crypto here um can you put those in the post jeremiah i i, I thought the whole point is they didn't like really exist no. Uh, welcome to the crypto episode of no um no 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 none, no, no, none no. of that none of that here um but mistakes want to make mistakes and the, the the one person who started the mistakes is adrian so what happened tell us well, well first of all can i ask I, you are there mistakes are there ever mistakes adrian of course there oh. are <laughs> <laughs> well, mine weren't. Mine were on purpose, but but it's but I appreciate. So I've just got the little segue into into mistakes were were made right today. So so I was out this morning walking my dog, as I often do, and I took a camera with me as I often do, and yet again I find myself having to shoot you know, sort of up to to two stops overexposed. You know, maxing out my exposure comp dial on the camera. And that's because it was a nice bright morning and I have a black dog <laughs> or, or an almost black dog. Anyway, she's got bits of other colors in her as well. But largely speaking, she is uh, she is non reflective, <laughs> which is not good for a photographer <laughs> having a non reflective subject. Right. She, she soaks up the light. So, you know, here's here's one, uh, you know, uh, Chris is showing now of her, you know, relaxing on the couch. Uh, then the, then there's, you know, uh, and, you know, that's overexposed uh, just to make the to, so you can see the features in her fur and her eyes and everything. And then the next one is her out and about this morning uh, and, you know, uh, you know, just trying to, to grab a, a shot of her in the forest. This is um, following on the, from the infrared conversations actually last week. This is definitely not an infrared <laughs> photo. Uh, it's a very crunchy black and white photo, but it's shot at two stops over so that I can get some detail in, in Jasmine, the dog. Uh, and that puts all the pine needles and it, that were on the floor in, in the forest. Um, doesn't, does, uh, isn't that why, why fill light was invented? <laughs> yeah she was quite a long way away though and anyway it seems a bit rude to like blast a flash at a, a, a dog um they have also from challenges. looking at it it just seems that um you know uh, being in focus is way overrated yeah thanks for that yeah yeah, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> so the, it was a snapshot but then this is the th this is the third shot and the last of three to get us into the proper topic uh this is what happens when you say okay well i'm on this setting so what happens if i just take a, a shot of, uh, of uh, the trees because i happen to notice that if i where i was stood i could get a, a picture of some trees in a line receding into the distance and it has a uh, uh, an interesting effect where every yeah everything that is effectively you know uh, above about a medium grey is just white, <laughs> um, and it almost looks like it's snowing even though I've taken this in it, August. I could have I could have bought this as a as a winter photo, totally. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So yeah, that then is a do we count that as a mistake? It's certainly or, or do we count it as a deliberate mistake? Um, it was a it was a uh, a creative test, let me say, right? Uh, maybe not. Uh, I was thinking, okay, I'm going to just try and shoot like this now and see how it can come out. I like a high key picture every now and again, right? So 
So, uh, and the setting I had on my camera is one of my favourite, you know, grainy, grungy, back black and white settings for, for graphical photography. So, you know, so it, it's kind of that, but boosted beyond belief uh, so that uh, you, you, you uh, lose some of the contrast and get some of the detail can, back, can so, we, sort of, in a way. Can we agree that, that um, a mistake would be uh, where in a photographer set out with a specific intention and settings to capture an image um, with intent, made um, a series of images that had nothing, <laughs> nothing remotely to do with that intention uh, because the settings were wrong, a mistake was made in terms of the aperture, uh, if it was film, loaded the wrong film <laughs> and settings instead of a... ISO 25 was an ISO 3200, and what came out was something very different than the expected image, and yet they liked it. Um, that, that, that would be a happy mistake or a lucky mistake. A happy mistake. mistake. The, the opposite is uh, many of us in, in the past uh, had shot a roll of film and sent it to the lab, and when we got back, it was just black. And, um, you know, anybody who's been in photography for a long time has experienced that uh, kind of stomach fallen, you know, <laughs> moment where those images will never come back. They didn't get recorded. There was something. Maybe the film is totally clear. Maybe it never moved in the camera. There's all kinds of things. Or a series of, of uh, double or triple exposures that created some kind of artistic genius out of the photographer who claimed that was the original. <laughs> Accidental genius, yes. That's it. So, uh, you know, but if we're sticking on exposure for a second, exposure is often something that will lend itself to happy mistakes. I find that overexposure on film, color or black and white, um, is often a much more rewarding um, image. Like, for example, if you're shooting ectochrome and uh, overexpose it, and, and so, so much of it is blown out and you get a little pastel color um, in the blown out highlights. So they're almost like paintings. Very, very, very beautiful. Whereas when you shoot digital, when things are overexposed or gone, they're just gone. There's, there's nothing there. There's not even film grain as texture to embrace. Yeah. Um, exposure being one of the many, many possibilities here, right? So exposure is is easy to play with. And, and, and for me, it has often happened in the past that these mistakes turned out to be, well, gifts in disguise, right? Yeah. When you yeah, end up with, 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 just, with just something that you totally didn't expect and that, you're, that, you're, that, that was not part of your creative toolbox. So you couldn't even go there if you wanted to because you had no idea this existed. And then all of a sudden this happened and you, you ended up learning something from it and, and incorporating some of that into your, uh, into your portfolio in the future. Do you, do you find that, that uh, what I was talking about in film, um, I'm just talking about exposure and, and kind of broad exposure bracketing, say three stops on each side, mm -hmm. will give you a, a huge palette. And, and often that stuff, even in the crushing darkness, you can dig out enough information to have something moody and and um, in mo enough modern, contrast. Modern modern sensors, um, especially the bigger ones, uh, have an, an an amazing amount of of latitude, uh, latitude there. So um, I've seen pictures that were almost black or black to the eye, and and you could create from that an, a, a virtually perfect photo. So with the, with the latest, uh, like the flagship cameras, the, the new Canon R5 III uh, II and so on, they, they certainly have that latitude. Um, but then I it's not a mistake, right? It's, do, no. But then it's a mistake you recovered from. And or it's a deliberate mistake. A or, mistake well, in that defining uh, the perfect exposure is something you don't want. 
But but going back to what you said earlier, is is a mistake? Are there mistakes? Are there mistakes? Um, let, let's look at a few. things. Sound like choices to me, right? So, right. So you're, well, you're, you're, you're making a creative choice at that point. I mean, I I accept the thing about you know the 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 film camera that didn't wind on properly every time, so yeah, you get you, multiple exposures. That, that's setting. an accident, right? That that's an accident. So so you know, whereas whereas a a creative choice is is something different. It's a positive thing, isn't it? Right. It's I am choosing to expose this so that it gets a moody look about it, or I'm choosing, you know, to to do something different, right? It's it's well, part of the creative right. vision. Yeah. So let's let's say let's say mistake it's a mistake if you didn't choose to do it, if it happened. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Similar to like uh, last night you shot at ISO twelve 12,000 something and uh, you forgot to reset it in the morning and then you go out in the sunlight and you wonder why your shutter speeds are also short until you finally notice that sure. the camera is overexposing yeah, everything. Well, with, um, with, you know, segue to focus, for example, yeah. uh, about 10 years ago, I set out to do a folio of um, photographs based on how I truly see without my glasses. Mm -hmm. like, the, the, and finding the exact amount of defocusing or blur. How how uh, blind are you without glasses? Well, now I'm not blind. That uh, you had you had him you had all, him, uh, because I I've had my yes. lenses <laughs> changed, yes. but at that time quite you know maybe a, a minus six minus seven so that's pretty it's quite intense quite intense yeah. uh, and and I I found. Uh, the kind of sweet spot, and I photographed all over the world from, you know, from Chile to, um, you know, the North Pole, just all over, deliberate defocused settings and, and made really, really uh, incredible you know, large prints of them. And it was, it was really, really interesting because people were see seeing these pictures exactly the way I see without my corrective lenses. And, and it was a very, um, it was an invigorating and, and extremely satisfying project. Uh, that, you know, there, I remember images of fishermen in Fiji that are, they look like impressionist paintings on the, on the ocean. And yet so, question. Yeah? Question. Were these the only pictures you took there? Or did you also take, air quotes, proper pictures? No. How's that for oh. bold? Okay. So right. then, and they be, because that is, I, I, I do this exercise in, on workshops where I, where I tell the students, now, next, next hour, all the things that you think are sacred in photography are out the window. And we yeah. are going to, to for everyone choose their most important thing, the focus, the, the, the exposure and so on, and, um, and, and, make, and do it the wrong way. Of course, and, I exaggerate a little bit, depend, you know, depending and people, on... And people, I, are, I see people being really, really um, uncomfortable. Scared. Doing these things, scared yeah. that they are not getting a picture back. Someone, someone recently asked me, um, he's, he's going backpacking to Bangladesh, and uh, he only has, like, the backpack, and so very limited weight that he can take, and uh, that results in one camera and one lens. And he ended up choosing a 35 millimeter lens on a full frame, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people who say, I could never do this. I need my zoom. I need my five, uh, five focal lengths. I need whatever, two cameras and a crop and so on. Um, for a lot of people, that is really scary. But then in the end, when I do this exercise, um, on the other end, people come out with a big smile because... That changes something. That's that's a, that's a, I'd say a creative limitation, that or or a, or a limitation that boosts your creativity. Sure. I mean, we've yeah. we've talked about uh, you know yeah. a, a great way to learn photography is to, for a year, one camera, one lens, one ISO setting, whether it's film or, or or digital, and just discipline to know every parameter of that lens combination and film combination and you will learn so much and if you if you step outside of that middle range where everything is comfortable and correct air quotes again yeah. um, 
then then you figure out where are the limits, where are the boundaries, and yeah. when do I get over that boundary, and what happens when I do that. Yeah, and and also with everyone with multiple cameras around their neck and all kinds of lenses in their bags, and they get to an environment or a moment, they have to spend time figuring out, oh, this would be better with a 100, maybe a 75, and... All that thinking time takes away from the connection of the photographer and the moment or yes. the environment or that moment of light. If you have one camera and you know how to use that, you will find a way to instantly create that connection with what gear you have. Mm. And the more you do it, the better it is for your development. And and after a year, and a year, you know, uh, goes by quite <laughs> quite quickly, um, then you take another lens and another ISO. One lens a year. That sounds yeah. like a like a good goal. It is it is a good goal. After five years, I think you'd know your equipment. Of course, then <laughs> there's new yeah, equipment. Yeah, but then all your equipment would be obsolete <laughs> right, and you need to buy exactly. new stuff. So but Then so. you have to start again. But isn't that the joy of exploration? So. <laughs> It's so it, I have. I think it, for me, a year is is an extended period for an exercise like that. I mean, don't get me wrong; I can totally see the benefits in it. You know, uh, in having an extended period, but uh, I'm I'm more fickle than that. You know, I I, I love to play, so, uh, so I, I'm more w w whimsical in what I choose to shoot with. <laughs> so back back to mistakes. And uh, deliberate mistakes. One one of the mistakes that was probably one of my favorite mistakes that you can do um, is to move the camera. Yeah. The 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 motion motion of the camera while exposing um, is can be driven to the extreme. I I remember with being out with a group, we we stand in on a lawn, and we throw our cameras in the air we do camera tossing um not not like really high but left hand on the on the on the strap and right hand on the camera little self timer two seconds and then right before it goes off you toss the camera in the air it was it was night so there were street lights and things and it ended up being like totally not dangerous because you had the left hand around the strap and um and ended up being some of my favorite photos. Very abstract, very just weird, sure. weird um, zero gravity kind of stuff, you know, in the Ditto. camera. Yeah, using, uh, you know, a 10 ND um, bright sunlight, yeah. stop down to F11 and shoot it one second. Yeah. Just, just like, you know, not even trying to move it, but just, you know, regular little movements. You get very interesting um, connections, I think, and a different way of seeing because, you know, it, the way the human eye sees, we see certain wavelengths. We talked about that last week. Yeah. But there's a lot we don't see, and animals see in different ways as well. And Another so one that, that was easier with, with older film cameras, but um, that, that's kind of that you have to be very deliberate about these days is a, is a multiple exposure. Um, double, triple exposures. A again, one of my favorite group shots I did on a workshop when I, when I played with a large format pinhole camera. And you know how you, ha how you have the film in cassettes and the cassettes were not labeled, of course not. And I also did a bad job labeling the ones that were already exposed. So I ended up triple exposing the same piece of film. <laughs> and it was a group shot with the front, like overlaid with the front of a Mercedes, old Mercedes lorry, and some plants. And it was, I, I'm, I'm still so fond of that. Yeah, that's, a, genu that's a genuine accident, but a very happy one by the sound of it. I was a real, real I, when I, when I, and, and of course, I ended up developing three sheets of film. And the first two were empty, and so I thought I like oh, right. the, the film was broken. And then when I developed the third one, it's like, oh, That's there like, they oh, went. There they are. <laughs> Have you seen these photographs? There's an artist, Jacob Gilles. Um, 
think he's French. Uh, you know, we're, we're in, you know, you, you will take a photo or a hundred photos of the same object, handheld, and then you will just layer them together. So uh, they I have become, not seen that, no. Become impressionistic. Uh, you know, there's work of monuments like the Eiffel Tower, trees, um, just still objects that you just layer uh, the same object onto itself, but with very, very slight movements. Uh, it becomes something other than any of the individual images. Um, and, and again, you, you know, you learn, is it better to take a picture at one second, half second, quarter second? You know, all of those things uh, at uh, playing with ND filters also allow some parameters of exposure in bright light that are worth exploring. So that just piling on filtrations and <laughs> worrying about the vignetting later is an interesting way to create deliberate mistakes uh, of exposure and focus. Um, again, we talked about IR focusing last week that, you know, what you see is not often what you get. Um, and those kinds of um, dogs on the move, dogs out of focus, that energy that comes out of a, a, a still photo is often so much better than a frozen image or even a filmed image of the same subject moving. Because it just De definitely, I mean, especially, you know, it, it's interesting uh, when you're in a city where there's lots of movement as well. It's great for and it doesn't necessarily have to be street photography per se, but you could be taking a photograph of a vehicle going by or something like that. And just playing with the shutter speed down to I don't know, a fifteenth or an eighth or something like that, and 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 tracking to keep the subject broadly sharp as, as best you're able, but then letting the, the the surroundings, you know, just go to wherever they go to, you know, with with a lot of motion blur. Uh, that's that's a, a nice one for me. I I do like playing with it. Something yeah, I do well, deliberately of of on occasion. Or conversely, just setting your camera up on a tripod with a again an ND lens. And opening up to bulb setting and just let all the traffic and people disappear. And all of a sudden you're going to see your city in a whole different light. Here's another one where I, I, and I, I like letting chance play out. And that is um, to not frame the shot, but to let the framing happen. As mm. in shooting from the wrist kind sure. of things. Yeah. Um, especially in street photography where you might be like a bit worried that someone will spot you um so shooting from the wrist will end up giving you angles and weird compositions and and people being cut off in strange ways that you would not have done any other way and again after doing that for an hour somewhere you you end up having at least five to ten awesome keepers because they yeah things will I would just say happen that's my f that, that's my favorite way to create a Deliberate mistakes, fun, randomness, and mm -hmm. um, exploration. I think I had mentioned that that uh, I was using an Insta Insta three hundred and sixty mm -hmm. uh, when I was locked down in New York City uh, during the COVID days, and I just I would walk around Central Park every day um, masked, and you know I hung the camera from my chest, and you can connect it to your ear and i would just like shoot <laughs> shoot oh, ex exposed with the, with a button on the on the earphones yeah yeah and not even a button but voice voice activated so i would just be walking around and telling the camera when to shoot it's got <laughs> wild images it was lots of fun very inconspicuous walking so, around so let me get this click, straight you were talking around. to yourself you were wandering around new york city wearing a mask saying shoot 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 Oh. Around the park, uh, Central Park. It's not exactly. <laughs> what what was the keyword? Was it click? Was it take a picture? I, I think it was shoot or something like that. I forget. That sounds very very like. I, I would. I probably wouldn't do this in the in New York City. Let's put it I this way: it. I wouldn't do you're it not London. getting the decisive <laughs> moment. There is there is you'll a get, delay. You'll get you a, bet, you'll get a very anticipate. strong response in London if you do that. <laughs> <sighs> Certainly now. So, uh, what 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 do we? 
Multiple exposure well, we talked about in conventional angles, white balance. That's another another thing of, of, of just playing with with color, overall color. Um, and your... setting your camera to the wrong white balance for the scene and right. not fixing it later. Because with if you shoot raw, it's easy to fix, but you want you want the mistake in that case. So um, yeah, going shooting that, that happens blue, blue faces. Why not? That happens a lot if you shoot a Fuji camera and you're into the Fuji recipes you know, world <laughs> uh, where you have, you know, because uh, a lot of people have put a lot of effort into designing recipes for the JPEGs uh, and uh, that, that you program into the camera. And often they have a, a fixed white balance because they are, for example, trying to emulate a film, right? Uh, uh, and a film is it would be rated either, you know, tungsten for indoors, of course, or, or a, many of them, the majority for outdoors. So you can get quite, a, you can end up with a very, very warm looking JPEG uh, if you're shooting indoors with, say, a, a Portra 160 recipe, which is, you know, uh, which, which is trying to, uh, to, to, to take a, a daylight uh, type approach so yeah that, that and that can be interesting actually it can um quite create quite a um do you know it, it sounds odd but it, it, it can create quite a, an intimate look you know to be massively over warm like that um uh, as if you're sort of being lit by a fire off that's just out off camera or something like that so it's uh that can be quite nice sometimes that's why I, I do um think that a lot of these <clears throat> deliberate mistakes tend to work I don't want to say better but but with a more deliberate kind of end game using film cameras like there's it's just because because it robs the film camera robs you of options yeah it takes away uh, options that you would otherwise be thinking about and playing with and so on so that mo the moment you don't have these options is going to be the moment where you start thinking about the photography yeah, and not the. the that's one of the reasons it. I love the Holger so much because <laughs> yeah, nothing to say. There. <laughs> oh, there's, there's one setting, right? Is it cloudy or sunny? And you just put it to cloudy and depends on the model. Business, some right? models, because some models that that switch doesn't do anything. So <laughs> yeah, no, I've got modern Holgers where the switch actually changes the uh, uh, yeah modern the, the aperture. <laughs> yes, uh, is that um, like the so elevator button <laughs> in many buildings? Yeah. Or or yeah, the yeah. or the New York City. Um, um, Traffic light button, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 exactly. But but no, so so that but that literally takes away everything because you've got no you you've got a fixed shutter speed at whatever it is, and that and it depends on the camera and how old the springs are in it, <laughs> uh, and you've got one aperture. If you just set it on the the cloudy setting, um, then because if you overexpose your film by a stop because it's actually sunny, then as Jeremiah said, you just get a nice Who outcome, cares, right? Yeah. The film, <laughs> most films, uh, or at least most negative films, will have plenty of latitude to be shot one step overexposed so stick it on the cloudy setting which is only about f8 anyway if you're lucky uh and and go with it and then you've got it really is point and shoot at that point and then of course you you can get the happy mistake of forgetting to wind on of course with the whole gut or winding on slightly too far or not far enough if you're not watching the window on the back of the camera you know where the numbers line up uh but yeah you know yeah. all good fun and there, there, there's interesting kind of surprises to my daughter just gave gave asked me if I wanted these cameras that that she had that are no longer working. I think one is a an Olympus. Um, you know, it's a, a DSLR, and but the shutter um, curtain doesn't work anymore. And you know, it's an old camera, so um, I said, yeah, yeah, give it to me. And I, it's it's currently on my <laughs> on my table with a bunch of jeweler screwdrivers. <laughs> I'm going to attempt to take the um, camera apart and put it back together again. We should we should make an ep an episode on reviving old old mechanical Gear. shutters because we've done that. Yes. Yeah, and and I've had both good and bad experience with it. But even bake if it, I poke bake a it in the oven, bake it in the oven. Something is seriously gonna, seriously uh, sixty Celsius uh, for an hour or two will soften the, the oh, maybe, lubricants yeah. and things, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I did have um, a one of my absolute favorite cameras of all time, which was the Hasselblad, um, what was it called, the model X-Pan? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, just, a, just an amazing camera. I mean, just so beautiful to work and shoot and use, and a lens, two lenses, beautiful. And... Um, 
I'd gone away for a year. When I came back, when I took it out to for a stroll, uh, the, the way the camera works is it winds the film to the end and then kind of every time you take a picture, it moves it back into the cassette. Well, all that's fine except the shutter curtain froze, wouldn't, wouldn't work. So, oh God, well, I just thought I'd bring it in. Brought it to a big camera store here in LA. And uh, they went, oh, this is, we got to send this to Hasselblad. And they did. And then Hasselblad said, no, sorry, we can't fix it. Uh, we don't make those materials anymore. I was like, what the? Are really? you serious? Yeah. And they said, no. That's not a can't. cheap camera. <laughs> no. And they basically boat anchored their own camera. I said, Holy well, shit. you're not even going to replace it. You're not going to stand by it. I mean, Leica, when it had its, its um, deteriorating uh, chipset, I mean, they, they for two or three years would just replace them yep. like that. And even afterwards, they charge you just basic, if you miss that window, cost to replace it. But Hasselblad did not stand by their camera, and I've never forgiven them. Uh, Hasselblad I... didn't make them, though, did they? It was made in Japan, oddly, and the... the um... It was made by Fuji. Was it? Possibly. Yeah, the X-Pan was made by Fuji, so but it was... The, um, you... There was a Fuji film version of it, which was called the TX-1 and then the TX-2, because there was an X-Pan 1 and an X-Pan 2, wasn't there? So, yeah, so I had the it, 1 it, and... Yeah. But they're, the they're legendarily, is, they're legendarily temperamental, aren't they? The X pans, you know. The, I the, didn't. I mean, I'd taken it all over the world and shot really beautiful landscapes up in the or in Patagonia at the time. And um, but you know, the problem is, they said, "Oh, the materials they used are no longer available because they're toxic." Well, yeah, love thanks, it when that happens. thanks for <laughs> thanks for wonderful sharing. excuse. Yeah. Wow. Th yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing. Uh, but the fact that they wouldn't stand behind their camera is just unforgivable. All right, last bit of last last mistake, um, and that has happened to me. Uh, I wonder if if it's happened to you. You go on, let's say, an assignment or a vacation or something, and you bring the wrong focal length. <laughs> And like, there, like, 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 like you're an arch architecture photographer and you bring the 100 millimeters <laughs> as opposed <laughs> to your <laughs> wide angles. So it has happened to me um, on, a, on a tour, photo tour, where I had a 24 millimeter. I had my, my zoom lens, the bit of a travel -y zoom lens, and that one broke in the luggage. It was Ding! Someone threw something on it, and the lens didn't work anymore. So I was stuck with the 24 for an entire um, Himalayan hike. <laughs> so I I made the best of it, and this completely kindled my love for the 24 millimeter tilt shift lens because that was my only lens I had, and I had. Is that to, where that comes from? Is it? That's where that comes from. I, I was I was. I was using that for like you're in the mountains. You want a you want a telephoto lens. You want to make make things big but i couldn't so i had to do different comp compositions i had to find different places to shoot from um and i ended up yeah falling completely in love with that lens it's still my favorite lens and, and conversely sometimes you want you want to get wide and you only have something long and yeah. um, it, fo it you know it focuses your attention on the detail and so you define the environment or the situation or the by the details that you put together. Something that was very, very well done, I think I mentioned this, a series called Ripley, which um, mm -hmm. you may or may not have seen or heard of. It's well worth it, all in black and white, beautifully done. And, um, you know, the sense of Italy at that time, of course, they have wider shots, but the sense of detailing that frame each individual scenario um, is extraordinary and really gives you the feeling, which is really what we're trying to capture here, the emotional feeling of being in a place. So lenses just offer you a different perspective, but the environment really remains as kind of inspirational as ever if you know what to look for and you don't kind of work against your gear, but you lean forward into it, whether it's a Holga or, you know, a very high-priced piece of kit, doesn't matter. And, and sometimes it 
really helps to be stuck with something for a while um, yes. and not being able to just switch to something else. So a year. <laughs> And yeah, some, sometimes an hour is fine. The, but one of my one of one of my favorite exercises is the uh, lock yourself in the bathroom and take one hundred photos exercise. Mm, and of course, sure. they all have to be different. So you end up with shooting twenty, and then you have everything, and then you shoot another twenty to thirty, up to fifty, and then it starts to become really difficult to find something new. And then you find yourself at photo 80 to you're close to giving up. And then somewhere in the 90s, you uh, end up lying on your back under the sink trying to find interesting <laughs> shapes and things. I mean, it's, it's really a good exercise, but it is it, it's painful the, to get it, there. It's pretty much the way I've learned photography. Yeah. Not, not in a In the bathroom. bathroom. In a very, very <laughs> small one-bedroom studio yep. apartment um, where I was pretty much locked down for, for a month. And I bought an enlarger and paper and chemicals and books on photography. And I yeah. had a lens and a camera. And all I did all day is take pictures of my environment and develop them and print them. Yeah. And that's how I learned to do that. that I literally am self-taught in that way. But I do remember loading, this is a, a little aside, loading my first film into the... Okay. And I went into the bathroom, closed the door, and went, oh, this is nice and dark. It's great. No. <laughs> I'm struggling with it, struggling Not with dark it. At all. Very slowly, I could see my hands. Yes. I could see, you know, all the light coming through the <laughs> bottom of the door. And, of yes. course, the pictures uh, resulted in a uh, clear view. So um, I learned that yep. you have to really black it out. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, one lesson at a time. Mistakes are often the best teachers. So That's true. Yes, very true. Having that said, uh, and before we get into the picks of the week, we have a quick follow-up from, from the last episode. On our Discord, Andrew wrote us um, about our con converting old DSLRs to infrared. He, he wasn't very happy with that idea because... Um, because he says mirrorless or point-and-shoot cameras are way better for infrared photography because you get a, a live view even with these um, with the filters on. Um, whereas an optical viewfinder on a DSLR will make focusing difficult with an IR filter. And I, I do agree, although I um, use live view on, uh, on a DSLR for that, and you can make this work, but it's definitely easier. But if that old DSLR is the only thing you have lying around, then it might be worth investigating if someone can convert that and still gives you what? something that is, that is more affordable. And don't you agree it only takes um, one roll of film or one kind of set of 50 exposures to figure out just that play between what you think is in focus and what isn't. And this only comes into play if you're shooting wide open as well. If you close it down, you'll have enough depth of field to accommodate that. It kind of depends on a bit on your, your, your experience in photography yeah. and so on. Uh, another point, um, again, if, if you want to read all his points, come to our Discord. The link is in the show notes and on the screen. Um, one one interesting thing, though, because we also said film SLRs are really good for that, and they are because they do not typically do not have infrared filters in them. Um, but he he wrote, choose your models carefully because some later models of some cameras use an infrared light for film tracking, so to see if the film is in or where it is, um, which can affect infrared film, of course, if you have an infrared light source in there. Um, and uh, then later on, like a Canon Canon One series, they have seals to prevent this, but some other cameras do not. So that's something to do some research on if you want an SLR, a film SLR, to use for infrared photography. Just do your do your due diligence. Go go and ask the according search engines. All right. Speaking of interesting photos. Um, the picks. I'm, I'm just going to start with my pick because it Go clearly, it. definitely links into what we talked about and that is the motion uh, while taking photos and, uh, of course, um, going back to camera tossing, which, again, can be at any height you wish or you can toss the camera, but very often it's not really super high. It's just a matter of 
getting the timing right. And then you end up with very cool abstract photos, um, especially at night with lights, with light sources. You can see they are they just some of them are amazing. The thing you will also see with, uh, with street lights, for example, especially with LED lights now, is that they ha are pulsed. So you will get little dotted lines instead of uh, lines going through. Um, depending on how the camera is falls or, or flies through the air, um, you get very interesting shapes. Often they are like Bezier shapes, um, that swirly kind of stuff, but sometimes it also ends up being just strange, but very organic usually. I wonder what they would look like converted to 3D. Um, that's mm -hmm. absolutely a good idea. Um, I've seen some. Let me let me scroll here. Some of them, of course, are like um, uh, self portraits, like not a long exposure, but a short one. Toss the camera up, and if you're lucky, it points down when it takes the photo. Um, so an aerial aerial kind of uh, photo, and then some of them I've seen, especially the ones at night, where where they inverted the photo, so you end up with these shapes, but they are dark on bright and I mean this one here look at that isn't that just wild yeah that's so, great anyway that is camera tossing and the the, the camera toss gallery on on uh, Flickr is is great great stuff there all right um, Adrian you brought us the Mangrove Photography Awards 2024. What is the Mangrove? Yeah. So uh, I, I just wanted to be um, very specific. So I actually looked up what was the definition of mangrove just to make sure that yeah, uh, it, it, I was representing this properly. And it, it, it literally is a, a, a type of tree or bush. Uh, yeah, well, many different species, but, but trees or bushes that grow in, in the edges between salt water and uh, and either the land or, or fresh water and and biologically they're they're slightly different because they're better able to process uh, salt um but the importance of this is this is a, a photography award which actually looks to highlight the environmental risks to mangroves because a lot of them are very uh very fragile environments and so this award uh the, the, this award looks to to both celebrate the mangrove and to to raise awareness of, of the lives of people and the lives of, of the mangroves themselves which which are are at risk there are lots of uh they start off with some quite sad photos actually of people who whose homes or businesses are in in this kind of area and uh, and are being damaged as as the sea rises um there's a, f a fantastic funny one you're showing there which is of a a a, 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 a mud based ceremony where somebody has had their whole head and body encased in mud from, from the mangrove uh, to, to, what end, the head. <laughs> to what end i don't know exactly um yeah quite what it's supposed to do for you i don't know um but there it goes on to you know there's there's, there's wildlife so this one here of a, a, a turtle that's been you know um rigged with a satellite you know tracker so that you can tell what what's happening to the marine life in the mangrove areas uh, there are some overhead landscapes, uh, you know, people interacting with the environment. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of stuff, actually, that, that really explores, um, you know, uh, this particular type of environment uh, and, and how and the, play, the place they play in people's lives. Um, so, yeah, I just just caught my eye this week. Um, a uh, really long web page linked in the show notes that you could scroll down and see lots of different things, lots of um, lots of things to um, to make you think. I like it. I, I can't stop scrolling. Exactly. No, totally. It goes on for ages. So, so you know, if everybody wants to sit in and have a little bit of quiet time on the podcast, oh, well, that one was quite a good one. If you start there, there there's one here which is um, shot uh near where in florida near where the um the spacex launch site is but apparently oh. the, the 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 large number of uh the large number of rocket launches um uh, in this particular area are actually impacting the um uh, the environment of the uh the the lakes and the mangroves around where the where the rockets take off so although it's a very impressive and striking photograph it, it comes with a a warning uh, a warning tale with it. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, lots of stuff. Interesting. Cool. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. We'll put a link in the show notes. And last but not least, Jeremiah has a new gadget. I do. What I do. I'm bringing Hobolite. gear. And forgive the uh, the sounds of the police helicopter hovering over. Venice. Are they coming this to get you? It's a familiar sound to those of us who live in L.A. And uh, but uh, that's the sound you hear. Is the they're about to land on top of you? <laughs> that's yeah. what it sounds they're like. coming for your squirrels, uh, aren't they? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, my pick, if I could shout above it, is the Micro Studio Light. It's a what's it called? A Hobolite. Yep. Uh, which I have in my hand. It is absolutely a dazzling piece of of kit that I am totally in love with. It you can adjust your color, your Kelvin, yeah, the kind of spread you have in terms of crystallizing the spread of light. It comes with color filters, soft domes. Um, and it's extraordinarily well made. It looks like a little camera, really. Yeah, it does. But, but it is, um, it's just a joy, especially if you're uh, kind of focused on, you know, uh, macro photography or shooting uh, in studio, but also just works really, really well in terms of it looks <laughs> it looks very it looks very retro with a, with a looked, leathering yes. on and stuff. I think all their all their lights they make a whole series um, um, are very very well designed and and um, beautifully just beautifully manufactured and not hyper expensive so um, worth worth looking at if you're looking for a, just a small little light um, you know to yeah use. I, I have seen these I saw them at the the photography show earlier in the year and had a player almost bought one or maybe even more than one I um, do remember they, you talking about this but this is the the micro version of it so it's really shrunk I mean palm of your hand they have some that you know that are, are hold more. it up again for for yeah. those are watching the video just want to see it um oh yeah that's tiny oh yeah it is very tiny it's very it? small yes. yeah. looks like a camera yeah, and here's your, your controls and your charging, and it has a removable lens. I mean, that's really... Yeah, really no, nice. that's great. I don't think I saw that micro one. That may be a new one. But yeah, they're, they're, they're marvelously well-made things, and they, they look delightful. And, uh, um, you know, the, it, it makes you think, because so much, I mean, if I think of the lights I've got around me and, and the lights I use, so, I mean, they're very, very practical, but they're not exactly good-looking, most of them. They, you know, they're... You know, you know, yeah, metal or black plastic or, or whatever. You know what's you know, nice, so. Adrian, is is like getting a new camera. You go like, oh, yeah. I want to just play with new, that. When you new have gear a new, has the potential to unlock something in you. Yeah, yes, it's it like, does. oh, what can I light? What color yeah. can I use? And, and um, now that I'm kind of breaking in a new studio, I have some room to just... Spread new out. big, new big studio and one micro light, and that's that's, that's your that's your challenge for one entire week. Only that's that it. light. And I'm very happy to undertake that challenge. That will be your challenge. All right, everyone, that oh, was good. it for today. Um, let's let's finish. Let's end the show before they really come. They get, land on me. Get him. <laughs> oh well. So making mistakes. Yeah, we've all made mistakes. Plenty of I them. enjoy making mistakes. It's, well, to it's, a point. For me, for me, actually, making mistakes is by far the most important way to learn new things by messing up. By With, without a doubt, yes. And um, yeah, I've, I've I've taken away things from the mistakes I made. Anyway, somebody's this, made a mistake and is running away. From someone's the making a mistake <laughs> listening to this episode right now. We will be back soon. Um, this was The Future of Photography. Find us at thefutureofphotography.com. Um, until next time, everyone, take care and bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Hold up. 